one of the seminar organizers, along with uh, James Gucci, Becca Guth-Metzler, and Albert Fehrenbach. Um, if this is your first time attending these sessions, our PCE3 seminars take place every three weeks, and they cover a range of disciplines within prebiotic chemistry and environments. Uh, sorry, one sec. And um, the primary focus of the PCE3 seminar series um, is on research that is being conducted by early career researchers. The first portion of today's session will uh, consist of presentations from our guest speakers. Our two main speakers today are Sukrit Ranjan and Meng Guo, and we'll have a short topical introduction from June Koronaga as well. And then the second portion of the seminar will be an open question and answer period and a discussion with our three guest speakers. And at that point, we'll be opening up the Zoom chat so that you can type in any questions that you might have for the speakers. Um, and we will also have the opportunity to continue the science discussion after the seminar through our PC3, PCE3 Slack group. Um, if you have not joined the Slack group already, we'll be posting a link in the chat so that you can um, sign up and continue the science dialogue after the seminar. So with that, um, we will go ahead and get started with today's presentations. And to start off, we will be having a short introduction from June Koronaga. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And June, if you'd like to start putting up your presentation, um, I'll just give you a quick introduction to June. Um, so June is a professor of Earth and Planetary Sciences at Yale University. He received a PhD from the MIT Woods Hole Joint Program and was a Miller Fellow at UC Berkeley before joining Yale in 2003. He has worked on the thermal and chemical evolution of Earth and Earth-like planets by integrating geology, geophysics, and geochemistry in recent years. Um, and his group is focusing on early Earth dynamics and its impact on surface environments. And with that, June, if you'd like to go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you, Danielle. Okay, so we now have quite a few talks given for this PC3 seminar series, and many of them touched on or were based on the notion of wet dry cycles on exposed land, which we can trace back to Charles Darwin's famous speculation on the origin of life with a warm little pond. And I believe uh, Secret's presentation today is about chemical requirements for such wet dry cycles to work and their implications for the early Earth environment. But at the more fundamental level, for this hypothesis to work, we need to have exposed land to begin with. And this is where geology becomes important. Now, the problem is that the early landscape at first sight may not be quite favorable for the idea of wet dry cycles because there are at least two factors pointing to the possibility that the early earth was a water world. That is the entire surface was covered by the ocean. So there was no exposed land. So what are those factors? First, uh, it takes time for continents to grow to the present day level so we may not have enough continents to go above sea level in the early Earth. And second, we know that pre-tectonic steadily brings water from the surface to the interior over the geological time. And this means that the past ocean had to be bigger than the present day ocean. And current estimates suggest that the early ocean could have been twice as much as the present day ocean. And this also makes it difficult to have exposed land. Now, these are just qualitative arguments for water world. And uh, we can try to quantify how much exposed land could have existed in the past by building a geophysical model for the Earth's landscape. But this is actually a very difficult problem because to find out how much exposed land we have, we need to know not only what's happening in the continental domain, but also uh, how the oceanic domain is doing at the same time. For given ocean volume, 
is a relative buoyancy of the Canelo domain with respect to the oceanic domain that determines the extent of exposed land. So we need to know pretty much everything about Earth's evolution. We need to know the mass of continents and their thickness. We need to know the ocean volume. We need to know the thickness of ocean crust and also the uh, thickness of lithospheric mantle beneath it. Uh, we need to know how hot the mantle was, how fast plates were moving and so on. And all of these things can change with time. And in the last several years, my group has been working on the evolution of these various components. And man's presentation is mostly about the evolution of continental crust. And I hope that non-geologists will appreciate the subtle nature of this geological foundation for the notion of wet dry cycles. And um, I guess that's it from me. Thank you. Thank you, June. Um, so we will move straight on to uh, secret, or sorry, actually Meng's presentation. Um, Meng, if you'd like to start putting up your presentation, I'll do a quick intro. Yeah. Okay. okay. So. so you guys can um, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, it looks great. Um, so Meng is a PhD candidate of Earth and Planetary Sciences at Yale University. Uh, she worked in the earthquake administration of China as an analytical researcher between 2012 and 2016, after receiving a Bachelor of Applied Chemistry uh, from Central South University. From 2016 to 2018, Meng Guo was sponsored by the Fulbright Scholarship and received a Master's in Geochemistry from the University of Maryland College Park. She is currently focusing on the history of crust mantle differentiation on Earth using geochemistry and geodynamic constraints. And you're welcome to go ahead. Thanks, Mon. Okay, cool. Thanks, uh, Joan, for the introductory talk, and thanks, Daniel, for the nice introduction. So as you know, my name is Meng Guo. Uh, I'm a fourth year PhD student at Yale University, and I'm currently focusing on the history of crust mantle differentiation on Earth. And through today's presentation, I'm hoping to explain how the geological data can inform us about the early conditions of the Earth. So specifically, the early, development, the early development of the continental crust and the onset of plate tectonics. So as we know that the evolution of continental crust has always been a hot topic in geology because it is one of the important features that can characterize Earth. Oh, sorry. Cool. So if we take a look at our solar system, we see that among all terrestrial planets, only Earth has developed a dual crustal system. And the relatively low density and great thickness of continental crust allow its surface to, to be exposed above sea level, providing a unique environment for life. Also, through continental recycling and reworking, this can provide a negative feedback to the carbon cycle. And carbon dioxide is one of the most important greenhouse gases. So the negative feedback can contribute greatly to the long-term climate stability and biological evolution of the Earth. And in my talk today, I would like to first explain the relevance of continental formation to the early environment of Earth and the origin of life. And then I will explain in detail about how we can infer the history of continental formation using constraints from atmospheric argon. And last, I will end the talk with a likely scenario for the early Earth's evolution. Uh, so to begin with, we know the origin of life can be traced back to the Earth's first two geological eons. The unequivocal data of life can be dated back to 3.5 billion years ago, and the record may be even pushed back to the early Archean or the late Hadean. Uh, the synthesis of complex biomolecules involves polymerization of nuclear bases into nucleotides and nucleic acids, which requires very precise thermodynamic conditions. So as a result, the important questions to ask are, what would the Hadean world look like? 
and how could it facilitate the origin of life? And there has been two major hypotheses of uh, the origin of life. One of them is Charles Darwin's Warm Little Ponds. So in this ponds uh, allows for the long-term polymerization through seasonal white dry cycles. Well, the other hypothesis is that life originated in the deep sea hydrothermal systems. And in today's talk, I would like to focus on the warm little ponds hypothesis because it requires land masses that expose above sea level. In order to have a substantial amount of land mass um, that, that to be exposed above sea level, you need to have a substantial amount of continental crust. So by studying the evolution of continental crust, we can examine a geological foundation for the warm little pond hypothesis and the wet dry cycles. So other than the continental crust relationship to the wet dry cycles, the development of massive continental crust in the early Earth's history also serve as an indicator for the onset of plate tectonics. This is because that continental crust has a chemically evolved composition meaning that it is enriched in incompatible elements like potassium. So it is difficult to generate continental crust directly from melting the mantle. In order to make continental crust, you first need to create oceanic crust and hydrate it and remelt such a hydrated crust. And this process occurs primarily at arc systems associated with subduction. And subduction is possible only with plate tectonics. And in addition to forming continental crust, the operation of plate tectonics is essential for various aspects of life. For example, the plate tectonics can resurface the Earth, and by doing so, it brings a fresh batch of nutrients to the surface. Also, with plate tectonics, carbon dioxide can be sequestered into the mantle um, through subduction. The sequestration of atmospheric carbon is essential to convert the initially dense carbon dioxide-rich atmosphere into a habitable one. But, um, however, as important as plate tectonics is, when it started on Earth has always been a highly debated issue. So from the figure here, we can see that the proposed onsite times of plate tectonics is very diverse. It ranging from the Hadean all the way to the late Proterozoic. And this diversity mostly stems from the lack of data in the early Earth and the ambiguities in the interpretation of relevant geologic observations. So resolving the history of continental formation provides a new insight into the onsite time of plate tectonics on Earth. So after we knowing the importance of continental growth, many Earth scientists has tried to con constrain it. In this figure, the x-axis is time, where zero is present day, and 4.56 is the beginning of Earth's history. The y-axis is the continental crust mass normalizing to its present day value. So as shown here, we have a seemingly diverse set of models. However, if we dig deep into how this model were derived, we see that there are a few different types of gross models. So we're following the classification scheme of Coronaga 2018. We can group them into three categories, the crust-based models, the mantle-based models, and the others. So first of all, the crust-based models, they are estimates on the present day distribution of continental crust formation age. So they do not have information about the crust that has been recycled into the mantle. Thereby, they serve as the lower bound on the night continental growth. The mantle-based model, they aim at the night growth of continental crust by utilizing the complementary nature of the mantle and the crust. Well, the third type of growth models, they also aims at net growth, but some of them are largely speculations, while others employ quantitative but less direct constraints. And if we liken a night growth pattern to an impact apple, a cross-based model is an apple that has been bitten by plate tectonics. This missing part of the apple represents the subducted continental crust. 
And in my recent work, I aim to constrain the continental evolution using the history of argon degassing. This approach belongs to the third category as mentioned previously, because it is more indirect than the mental-based approach. But using argon degassing history is beneficial in at least three ways. Uh, first, if we compare the argon isotopic ratio in our atmosphere versus the composition of the sun, we know that the atmospheric argon composition has significantly evolved through time. This compositional difference indicates that argon-40 is continuously being generated from potassium-40 within the Earth and then degassed into the atmosphere during geological process. Therefore, the atmospheric argon is an integrated result of degassing from the Earth's interior. So its evolution can provide important insights into the development, into the development of terrestrial reservoirs. And second, as a heavy and inert noble gas, uh, argon can hardly escape from the atmosphere or react with other chemicals. And the atmosphere is chemically well mixed. So using the argon degassing history to infer crustal evolution, it suffers less from preservation issues. And third, the degassing models used to suffer from the lack of observational constraints on the Asian atmosphere. But recently, Puho et al. 2013 have provided new data on the argon isotopic ratio in the Archean atmosphere. This presents an exciting opportunity for this field. So in order for us to use the degassing history of argon to constrain continental growth, we need to understand how different geological activities modify the atmospheric argon composition. To begin with, Right after the Earth's formation, giant impacts are likely to have caused significant degassing from the pre primordial mantle. And after that, the degassing events from Earth are largely due to mantle magmatism and crustal process. As illustrated in this cartoon, two major reservoirs can release volatiles into the atmosphere. One is continental crust, the other one is mantle. So uh, the degassing process of continental crust is characterized uh, in red in this figure, uh, whereas the mantle degassing process are in orange. So we can see that the continental crust releases argon during its generation, recycling, and reworking process. On the other hand, the mantle degasses argon at mid-ocean ridges and hotspot islands. And we need to build a model that can capture all of these major geological act activities throughout the Earth's history. So the structure of our geochemical model is shown schematically here. We have considered three major reservoirs, the mantle, the continental crust, and the atmosphere. We also assume two different modes of degassing. One is a sudden degassing phase. So this phase corresponds to the giant impacts in the early Earth, during which we treat the high energy degassing process collectively as one single degassing event, where a large fraction of primordial argon can be released from the mantle into the atmosphere. The other phase is the continuous degassing phase. During this, the mantle releases argon through mantle magmatism, and uh, the crust does so through crust recycling and reworking. The potassium-40 in the mantle can be transferred to the continental crust through mantle melting. And part of it can be recycled back into the mantle through crustal subduction. Because these, um, there are quite a few processes occurring at the same time, so how to constrain them is the key to the success of this model. And what makes our model unique is that we are the first to quantitatively explore the effect of recycling and reworking on the degassing history of the Earth. In order to do so, we make the use of the present day crustal formation age and surface age distributions. For example, for a given night continental growth pattern, by using its differences from crustal formation age and surface age distributions, we can model the corresponding continental recycling and reworking rate respectively. So if you recall, I mentioned that the night growth of continental crust is like an impact apple, 
where the formation age distribution is like an apple that has been beaten by plate tectonics. Thus, knowing their difference, we can determine how much crust has been subducted into the mantle. On the other hand, the crustal reworking can age the continental crust. So knowing the difference between formation age and surface age distribution, we can model the corresponding crustal reworking rate. And in our model, we utilize several robust geologic observations to reconstruct a coherent story of continental evolution. These observations provide different but complementary constraints on continental formation. First of all, we use the argon isotopic ratio of the present day and Archean atmosphere to constrain the uh, degassing history of argon. Second, we use the Archean and Proterozoic mantle potential temperature to constrain the thermal history of the Earth. And as I have already explained before, we use the distribution of of crustal formation age and surface age distribution to constrain the extents of crustal recycling and reworking rate. The final successful models, uh, which is shown in green here, they satisfy all of these observations within reasonable uncertainties. In order to visualize our model preferred uh, crustal evolution pattern, in here I show the night continental growth pattern the crustal generation rate, continental re recycling rate, and reworking rate here. The dark green shades shows the middle 50% of all successful Monte Carlo results, while the light green shades shows the middle 90%. In these figures, the x-axis is time, while zero being the beginning of Earth's history, and 4.56 is the present day. The first important feature is, about 80% of the night continental growth pattern display rapid formation during the early Archean, with the continental crust mass being comparable to the present day mass. Also, all successful solutions exhibit intense crustal generation rate, recycling, and reworking rates during the early Earth and followed by rapid decrease. So such growth pattern requires vigorous mantle melting and crustal erosion in the early Earth, which result in significant amount of mantle and crustal degassing. And in order to understand how different degassing process contribute to the radiogenic argon abundance in atmosphere, their instantaneous contributions are compared here. So the mantle degasses argon at different rates while generating continental crust, the oceanic crust and hotspot islands. The important feature is in this model, the continental growth is the largest contributor to the atmospheric argon, which suggests the continental growth greatly affects the degassing history of the Earth. The second point is uh, the continental crust can release a significant amount of radiogenic argon-40 in the early Archean through crustal recycling and crustal reworking. So this requires abandoned pyrene isotope potassium-40 has to be in the continental crust. And the presence of potassium-rich continental crust requires the operation of plate tectonics in the early Earth. So to sum, the result of our model suggests the early development of massive continental crust and the onset of plate tectonics in the late Hadean to early Archean. And finally, let me talk about the implication of our argon degassing model um, for the early Earth conditions. So first of all, our results suggest the history of argon degassing favors rapid continental growth during the early Earth with the mass of continental crust is estimated to have already reached 80% of the present day level during the early Archean. The existence of early massive continental crust provides a foundation for the warm little pond models. However, the extent, of, uh, the extent to which the crust was submerged or subaerial needs further investigation. The second point is, our results suggest the early continental crust is highly enriched in potassium, and such enrichment is only possible at subduction zones. Thus, the operation of plate tectonics is likely in the early Earth, 
which also sequester atmospheric carbon dioxide through subduction. Uh, in the end, I would like to put our result in a broader perspective. Uh, I want to wrap up with the likely scenario for the early Earth conditions. And this scenario is based on results not only from my argon study, but also from our group's work on magma ocean uh, dynamics. Uh, to begin with, imagine we are in the very beginning of Earth's history. The result of my model suggests at this time, the chemically evolved continental crust started to appear on massive scale in the Hadean. And the rates of continental generation and recycling were much higher in the early Earth compared to present day. So therefore, uh, the rapid plate tectonics in the early Earth is called for to explain such rapid continental, ge continental generation, during which the atmospheric carbon can be sequestered into the mantle. And as a result, the initially uh, dense carbon dioxide rich atmosphere was converted into a habitable one. But on the other hand, our understanding of how a magma ocean solidifies tells us that while most of the carbon is uh, degas into the atmosphere, most of the water must be um, residing in the mantle. So the Earth is likely to be characterized by a white mantle and a shallow ocean. However, the rapid plate tectonics in the early Hadean would help to eventually degas most of the water that initially stored in the mantle. Then we move on to the early Hadean. So during this time, the continental crust and the ocean were both growing due to the rapid plate tectonics. The emergence of early continental crust above sea level depends on its relative growth rate to the ocean. So if ocean growth is less rapid than continental growth, a large amount of continental crust can be exposed above sea level at this time. In contrast, if you have gradual continental growth or very rapid ocean growth, it would be difficult to have a lot of exposed land in the early Earth. As a result, the combination of rapid continental formation and slow ocean growth are essential for white dry cycles in the early Earth's history. And last, we are now in the late Hadean to the early Archean. And this time, with the growth of ocean, uh, the Earth was characterized by a dry mantle and a deep ocean. So a dry mantle slows down the tempo of plate tectonics, which results in a positive night water influx from surface into the mantle. The continental crust was then exposed above sea level more steadily with the decreasing depths of the ocean. And from here, the Earth slowly evolves to the Earth as we know today. Uh, and that's it for my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Meng. That was really good. Thank you so much. Um, so we are going to transition directly into Sikrit's um, presentation and we'll leave the questions until the end of this um, third presentation. Uh, so Sikrit, if you wanna load up your screen. Okay, you already did. <laughs> Um, so Sukrit Ranjan is a Sierra postdoctoral fellow at Northwestern University. Uh, his research focuses on constraining the palette of environmental conditions under which life on Earth emerged to inform simulations of prebiotic chemistry and on the search for life on rocky worlds, which offers the potential to test theories of abiogenesis. Sukrit's work particularly emphasizes the surface atmosphere environment. Prior to his role at Sierra, Sucret completed a Skoll Fellowship at MIT and a PhD in astronomy and astrophysics at Harvard. And if you wanna go ahead, Sucret. Thanks very much for that introduction, Daniel. Um, are you able to see my slides all right? Yeah, it looks great. All right, so thank you very much to the organizers for the opportunity to speak here and for the, to the audience for being here. Um, as Daniel mentioned, my name is Sucret Ranchan. I'm a Sierra Postdoctoral Fellow at Northwestern. And I'm really grateful for, to Meng for the talk she just gave because it really sets mine up really nicely. Meng talked to us a little bit about the possibility of whether or not um, there was sub-aerial land available and therefore whether or not terrestrial waters, that is to say ponds, lakes, and things like that in, existed in addition to marine waters. Today I'm going to be talking about the speciation of uh, key chemical compounds for the origin of life on a comparative basis in each of these waters. 
with particular emphasis on these putative surface waters uh, that either existed directly on continents or perhaps through things like large volcanic islands. And I'll particularly be focusing on nitrogen and sulfur species. So just to give you a kind of overview, the work that I'm gonna be sharing with you today is fundamentally motivated by the discipline of prebiotic chemistry, whose grand goal is to understand how to go from this to this. Uh, by this, I mean, prebiotic chemistry is fundamentally trying to understand how do you go from the relatively comparatively simple palette of molecules and physico-chemical environmental conditions that abiotic processes like volcanism and wet dry cycles make available, and how do those chemically complexify into something that we might all agree is alive. Each of the kind of figures over here could be a talk in of, uh, in of its own. And in fact, early in this uh, seminar series has been a talk on its own. Uh, I'm gonna be focused on this step over here, the kind of physical chemical milieu at the time of the origin of life. And I'm particularly gonna be drilling in on just one small aspect of that, which is the availability of nitrogen and sulfur species in different natural waters on early earth. So um, kind of reemphasizing that last point, uh, there we're all familiar with the Chinops elements, the six elements, uh, the six atoms, which seem to be essential for life as we know it. I'm gonna be talking about just two of them, nitrogen and sulfur, and in the kind of uh, molecular forms and concentrations to which they might've been accessible to origins of life chemistry in early earth. The work I'm gonna be sharing with you today has been documented by a series of papers over the last five years. And at the end, I'll also share a little bit of unpublished work uh, on which we'd be particularly grateful for feedback if you have any, uh, as it's still in a very preliminary stage. But first, the nitrogen story. So the fundamental question about nitrogen for the, in terms of the origin of life is understanding where did the fixed nitrogen that uh, was initially incorporated into the very first proto-biological molecules come from? And the idea there is that, well, we know that there was pr probably a decent amount of nitrogen present on early Earth, just as there is now, but the problem is that it was present in gaseous form as this N2 molecule over here. This N2 molecule has a number of very wonderful aspects, but one wonder aspect that, uh, depending on who you talk to, isn't quite as wonderful is this incredibly powerful triple bond, which joins these two nitrogen atoms together. Uh, this is a very strong bond, and it makes this molecule extremely stable. It makes it so stable, in fact, uh, that it's very hard for uh, chemical and biological processes to incorporate this nitrogen into molecules, particularly molecules that exist in the aqueous phase. So the over that you can summarize the nitrogen problem is that there's plenty of nitrogen around as geological N2, but it's chemically inaccessible. How does it become accessible? Modern biology accomplishes this goal and this, uh, this task by using a series of incredibly sophisticated enzymes. But even for modern biology, even with all of its biochemical sophistication, this is an extremely challenging task. It's energy intensive, in many parts of the ocean and in other ecosystems, the availability of fixed nitrogen is, what's, uh, is what limits productivity, whether directly or indirectly. And uh, uh, just as an anecdote, for example, uh, fertilizer, one of the major components of fertilizer that enables the growth of crops is the availability of fixed nitrogen. So even for modern biology, this is a challenging problem to solve, and it's not solved in, a, in kind of a broad range of bioenvironments. And this makes the problem for the prebiotic era prior to the evolution of these sophisticated enzymes even more daunting. One solution that's been put forward starting about 30 years ago is lightning. Uh, this was originally proposed by Mancinelli and McKay back in the 1980s. And the idea there is that lightning is quite energetic and lightning has enough energy that it can potentially fracture this triple bond over here. When it fractures that triple bond, it creates reactive nitrogen species which participate in a reaction cascade Whose ultimate, um, whose ultimate outcome is the propagation of some of these nitrogen species into the aqueous phase in the form of RENA, primarily in the form of HNO, where it then undergoes further reactions whose end product, according to both theoretical studies and according to laboratory simulations, is so-called NOx, by which I mean nitrite and nitrate. Now, the fact that these are the forms, these molecules are the form in which uh, these theory and experiments predict fixed nitrogen avail was available on early Earth is particularly exciting because not only are NOx consuming metabolisms ancient, not only do they sit, uh, go back many billions of years, but NOx has also been invoked in prebiotic chemistry specifically. It has been invoked, for example, at deep sea hydrothermal vents as, the, as in, the, uh, in the origin of proto-metabolism as an electron donor. And it's also been invoked as a, um, 
it's also been invoked as a directly in periodic chemical studies that are relevant to surficial environments. For example, Mariani et al. 2018 demonstrated that it can drive, it can act as an activating agent to drive the oligomerization of RNA. So, it's, so this is a very attractive theory from those perspectives. It solves this problem and it also enables a, a, a swath of productive chemistries. Apologies. Uh, and so these motivations have led to this process being simulated in increasing detail over the past few decades, culminating in recent work, which really excitingly suggested that uh, NOx concentrations in the bulk ocean could have been as high as 10 millimolar, which is really exciting and, and to think about a little bit. And if it's that high in the early ocean, what about uh, early ponds? So this is the kind of thing that we wanted to look into a little bit more. And uh, kind of when we looked at it, we realized that these results uh, all share a kind of critical key assumption, which is that they assume that the NOx, once it hits the water, is stable in the water, unless it's processed at a deep sea hydrothermal vent. And this is broadly speaking true on modern Earth, which is a very oxidizing environment. But this uh, picture is a little bit different on early Earth, which is a little bit more of a reducing environment compared to today. And so that's the uh, kind of innovation we added in. We constructed a steady state model whose objective was to calculate the concentration of NOx in different aqueous environments, both terrestrial, that is lakes and ponds, and also marine. So uh, one process that we considered, which is the one that other folks had considered, which is deep sea, which is processing at deep sea hydrothermal vents. But there are other mechanisms which could have been active on early Earth as well. One of those is reactions with reduced species like reduced iron, both in free form and in mineralized forms, which have been experimentally shown to uh, degrade NOx. And we, uh, the presence of reduced iron is directly attested to geologically from the banded iron formations as well as uh, just direct UV photolysis. It turns out that UV light can quite efficiently in natural waters, that La caveat is important, in natural waters photolyze uh, nitrate to nitrite and photolyze nitrite further to NO, which is insoluble and then escapes to the atmosphere. So we built a kinetic steady state model, which, include, which builds on previous work by including these two processes, in addition to uh, this vents process that was incorporated previously. And we considered, uh, uh, we considered uh, the range of pH and temperatures that are shown on the bottom here as well. So what did we find? Our overall uh, takeaway message is that um, UV light in particular limited NOx concentrations on early Earth, orders of magnitude lower than what has been proposed previously. Uh, this plot illustrates the results for the early oceans. The top plot gives the, uh, on the top plot you have nitrite, on the bottom plot you have nitrate. Uh, the y-axis is concentration in, in uh, molar, and the x-axis is the night is the NOx supply flux from above. So this is what lightning is giving you. The gray shaded region over here corresponds to the range of NOx supply fluxes that are predicted from these photochemical and climate models, both ours and others. Just to give you a, a sense of context, this dashed lines in both plots corresponds to micromolar concentrations. So if you're below there, you're not even accessing micromolar concentrations of these compounds. And we take that as kind of our very fiducial boundary for prebiotic relevance. You need to be above that line in order to have significant amounts of NOx. And these different colors correspond to different assumptions regarding the total amount of iron that was around. Red corresponding to less iron, blue corresponding to more iron. And the thing that kind of jumps out, and that kind of jumps out is that if you incorporate these additional processes, in particular photolysis, you find that across the plausible range of NOx production, uh, production fluxes from the atmosphere, NOx is always low in the early ocean. It's always very low concentration due to that previously neglected photolytic sink. Uh, does that mean we're up the, uh, the river without a paddle? Not quite, uh, because uh, as Meng told us about, there's the possibility of having lakes and ponds on early Earth. And there, and for certain kinds of, uh, of uh, terrestrial waters, in particular, closed basin waters that are extremely shallow, much higher concentrations of NOx are possible. And that's both because you're diluting your atmospheric supply over a shallower column, and because you're, uh, you can have a high drainage ratio. In other words, you can, uh, con you can concentrate the uh, NOx delivery from a much larger surface area and then concentrate it all down via groundwater flows into a single pond. So if you incorporate that effect for that particular class of ponds, you find that it is possible to have prebiotically significant, that is more than one micromolar concentrations of nitrate in these shallow ponds across the range of parameter space. So the, the overall takeaway message there is that um, 
I'm uh, so sorry, this has all been theory so far. You might also be wondering is, is there any observational evidence to support this, uh, this theoretical prediction that NOx was low in the ocean, but potentially moderately high in some ponds? And the answer surprisingly, at least to me, is tentatively yes. And here I refer to work by Homan et al. 2018. Homan et al. 2018 analyzed a, sequ uh, a series of, very, of carrigens from about 3.2 billion years ago. So 3.2 billion year old organic gunk, gunk and quantified nitrogen and carbon isotopic synchrotrons from it. The special thing about their samples is that it included both marine, i.e. oceanic uh, carrigens, as well as lacustrine, i.e. lake-based carrigens. And what they found is that the lake-based uh, carrigens, some of the lake-based carrigens had isotopic signatures that were consistent with, nitri with nitrate reduction metabolisms going on. In other words, some of these lake-based uh, base samples were consistent with the existence of high concentrations of nitrate, but none of the oceanic samples were. So this is overall not conclusive, but it's consistent with the idea that uh, even on, er on early Earth, NOx could have been moderately high in ponds, but not in the oceans. So what are the implications of this insight for prebiotic chemistry? Well, there's a few different ones of them. The first is that for oceanic chemistry, if you want to have uh, your chemistry both function in the ocean and leverage NOx, you need some kind of local concentration mechanism. So for example, mineral adsorption would be something to, that would be interesting to look into experimentally to explore if there's minerals that might be able to somehow concentrate uh, NOx, at, in, for example, in pore waters, orders of magnitude above the oceanic mean. In that case, that is the venue in which these kinds of oceanic NOx dependent origin of life chemistries could function. In the pond side, on, on the pond side of things, it does suggest that um, NOx would have been available in, in uh, kind of terrestrial waters, but not in all terrestrial waters. It would only have been available in these kind of favorable environments, that is in particular shallow ponds and also closed basin ponds. Those uh, which have also been highlighted by other works, for, uh, for example, Toner and Catling 2020 as venues for prebiotic chemistry. Uh, the other important insight in my view for prebiotic chemistry is that uh, most of this NOx must have been present in the form of nitrate, not nitrite. And this is significant because most prebiotic chemists prefer to work with nitrate because it's much more reactive. But uh, from a prebiotic realism perspective, nitrate is the preferred molecule to work with. So that's the story with, uh, with, about nitrogen. What about the story with sulfur? With sulfur, I'm gonna change gears a little bit. I'm still gonna talk about um, kind of uh, focus on terrestrial environments, lakes and ponds, but here I'm gonna focus on what flavor of sulfur was available and in what concentrations as opposed to comparing two different environments. And particularly, I'm gonna focus on whether sulfur, uh, I'm gonna to propose to you that sulfur would, would have been available in the, more, in the form of sulfite, in addition to the forms of sulfate and sulfide in which it's already been considered to have been present on earlier. So previously by prebiotic chemists in particular, folks have considered hydrogen sulfide, H2S, as a prebiotic sulfur source, so as a source of reduced sulfur. And this is very attractive biochemically because our modern biology, as we know it, also uses reduced sulfur. So it's easy to, that kind of, that's kind of solving that aspect of the problem already. Uh, the problem with getting high, uh, high quantities of sulfide is that it requires very specific environments. For, you can get high quantities of sulfide in, for example, geothermal settings, such as uh, uh, systems that are similar to Yellowstone, or you could also possibly have gotten into the aftermath of large impacts where reduced sulfide is delivered from space. But it's a little bit harder to get significant quantities of reduced sulfur in bulk solution on early earth. And that's because sulfur is relatively insoluble. That's why when you go to Yellowstone, you get a little bit of a bad smell. That sulfur is continually exolving and having to be replaced from below. Uh, and as well as its uh, first association is disfavored. So it's not possible to kind of store a lot of it in ion form. And the question we set out to ask is, are there, is there a kind of more generally accessible source of sulfur that would be available to all terrestrial waters on early earth? And the specific idea we set out to explore is the atmosphere as a source of sulfur. So we know that volcanoes outgas sulfur in the form of H2S, but particularly in the form of SO2. And when that sulfur is outgassed, it builds up in the atmosphere, but it doesn't just stay in the atmosphere. It's also going to, dissoci it's also going to dissolve into, the, uh, into water bodies in accordance with Henry's law. And when, do when it does that, it's also going to dissociate. It's going to give you these sulfur-bearing species. It's going to give you sulfide, which, which we thought about previously, but it's also going to give you uh, sulfur in the four oxidation state in the form of sulfite, which are these two molecules over here. And so we just set out to build a very simple model that modeled, that, uh, modeled this process and calculated the concentrations of all three of these molecules as a function of total sulfur outgassing flux. 
And we found it necessary to uh, think about it as a function of sulfur outgassing flux because that parameter could have varied quite significantly on early Earth. Early Earth had epochs of high volcanism, for example, the emplacement of basaltic plains. Uh, to give you a sense of the scale of this, uh, the Deccan traps in, in modern India are an example of, of basaltic plains. And at time of emplacement, they're thought to have been three times this, uh, the size of the US state of Arizona, or I think about a couple times the size of the country of France. So this is the scale of volcanic activity we're talking about when sulfur uh, fluxes could have been enhanced by two to three orders of magnitude. Uh, and so, so to do this, the key input we needed was photochemical calculations, which we drew from the literature work of WHO et al 2013. Uh, to cut to the chase, this plot over here uh, summarizes our first order results. It's a little bit of a busy plot, so may, let me walk you through it. The x-axis here demarcates the sulfur supply to the atmosphere in units of, uh, of uh, centimeter square, per centimeter squared per second. The bottom plot shows the atmospheric um, H2S and SO2 as a, uh, as a function of the sulfur emission flux drawn from the model, models of Renyu Hu. And these top plots over here show the concentration of sulfide and um, sulfite as a function of sulfur emission flux. The plot starts over here at what we expect the sulfur emission flux to have been a kind of a quiescence and uh, baseline steady state volcanism. And the gray shaded region corresponds to what you might have had during epochs of intense volcanism. So this is kind of what you would have gotten transiently during uh, intense volcanic episodes. Uh, one thing that jumps out is that the sulfide never reaches micromolar concentrations. It's always suppressed to very low concentrations. And that's again, because it's relatively insoluble and because its first dissociation is not favored. On the other hand, sulfite uh, is across this range of parameter spaces quite high. You're able to access more than micromolar concentrations of this molecule throughout. And in the most intense of volcanic eruptions, you might even get close to the millimolar regime in some of these shallow ponds. Uh, you might be wondering, what does this mean for the UV surface UV environment in the sense that we know that atmospheric sulfur is also a UV shield? Uh, and the bottom line output there is that across most of the range of sulfur emission fluxes, abundant quantities of near UV radiation are available. We might then ask, okay, so there might've been this sulfide present and it, doesn't, and it probably wouldn't have blocked much of this UV, but what does that mean for prebiotic chemistry? To answer this question, we applied these insights to one case study of one of the proposed prebiotic chemistries that's been proposed, the so-called sulfidic uh, uh, chemistry that is articulated by the groups of John Sutherland, Matt Powder, and others. So this chemistry has a number of attractive aspects, in particular from a single set of uh, prebiotic precursors. It can generate with relative, selectively and with high yield ribonucleotides, amino acids, sugars, and lipid precursors. But from the point of view of what I've just told you, it has a negative, which is that it leverages um, sulfide, which I've said isn't universally available. So this is a special thing that has to be true for this chemistry to work. So we asked, what if you don't use sulfide? What if you just use sulfite? Does it still work or not? And the answer that we came up with was yes. And not only does it still work, it works a lot better. In particular, it works with a realistic amount of UV that was available on early Earth which the earlier mechanism that was articulated in the earlier paper does not. That this requires more UV that was available naturally in early Earth. And it works with copper as a catalytic partner, with iron as a catalytic partner instead of copper. And that's attractive because iron is thought to have been much more geologically common in early Earth. So for the price, so by increasing the realism of this chemistry along one axis, trading at sulfide for sulfite, fight, we've increased its prebiotic realism on two other axes as well. Three for one, can't do much better than that. Um, so that's what kind of ex uh, that's what kind of excited us there. Um, since uh, since our work, uh, others have done a bunch of follow have done follow up work and have derived even uh, equally if not more exciting results. For example, recently Becker et al. in the work in the group of Thomas Carell recently published the first kind of unified uh, pre potentially prebiotically plausible synthesis of both the pyrimidines and the purine ribonucleotides from a common set of precursors. And what excited us a little bit is that both of these molecules we've been talking about, the nitrate and the sulfite, were uh, key in this particular pathway. So uh, my overall takeaway message here is, but, is that by improving the plausibility of your prebiotic chemistries, you can also improve the, uh, uh, you can kind of discover new chemical pathways as well. So what's, uh, what's next? I promised you that there might, that we would be, uh, I'd be telling you a little bit about some work that we hope to do in the future. So the next step is, is to do for sulfur what we, what we did for nitrate. So for sulfur right now, we have a hybrid semi-kinetic, uh, mostly an equilibrium model where do the atmospheric kinetics but not the aqueous phase kinetics. 
And now we want to do the aqueous kinetics as well. So uh, we want to balance the sources of sulfur, which is, the, which is ultimately volcanism via atmospheric processing against the sinks of sulfur, which include disproportionation, photolysis, and seepage. Of these, the most important one that we need uh, to the most important one we need to model is uh, so-called so disproportionation, where that sulfur interacts with itself and, and forms both reduced and, oxid and oxidizes forms on some time scale. And the reason we need to constrain this is that while we have relatively good measurements for both of these parameters, we don't have very good measurements for this parameter. We'd like to understand this a little bit better. Okay, um, this brings me to the end of my talk, so I'm just going to leave you with the big picture. Uh, the big picture, the number one big picture I want is that to leave you with is that the prebiotic environment sets the prebiotic chemistry. So it's not enough just to do chemical studies in the lab. That's important. Uh, that's really important work. But we, in addition to that, we really need to understand the, the uh, prebiotic environment to understand first whether or not the stuff derived in the lab works, but then also to figure out how we can improve uh, the laboratory chemistry. Maybe there's possibilities that we weren't aware of that uh, and that improving the uh, simulation quality and fillability can uh, awaken our eyes to. Along those veins, we find that um, in early, specifically in early ponds, um, high quantities of NOx and sulfite were, uh, were present, uh, but not in the early oceans. So if you want these, uh, these molecules would have been available, but in a very particular prebiotic milieu, the shallow closed basin early ponds. Uh, and then again, as I kind of alluded to, if you, if you, incorporate these insights, you can not only uh, improve the realism of your prebiotic chemistry, but you can improve its function as well. In terms of next steps, the steps that are required to advance and uh, both gain a better understanding of nitrogen and sulfur uh, kinematics, but also to understand the interplay of these systems are laboratory measurements. We really, in, in particular, need to understand the kinematics of sulfite better, as well as uh, nitrate interactions with iron. I know that uh, Lori Barge, for example, is leading work on the latter topic. Uh, and then I think it'd be really nice if some of our geochemical colleagues could uh, look for additional ways to test these propositions that we're putting forward. In particular, look for more evidence of nitrogen and sulfur in the uh, rock record. That's about all I've got. I'd like to thank uh, our, our colleagues and collaborators and our funding sources, and I'll leave up my slides. And yeah, I'd love to take questions. Okay, thanks so much, Secret. And thank you to all three of you for three excellent talks. Um, so we're going to open up the chat uh, so that we can have a Q&A session. We have lots of time for discussion. So um, if you have questions for any of the three speakers, um, just please feel free to type them in the chat. Um, you can also just raise your hand and we can um, call on you that way if it's easier. And uh, yeah, and I think, um, okay, so let's see, um, too secret. Um, with closed basin ponds, couldn't you, couldn't you postulate, couldn't you postulate that any concentration is possible down to crystallization? In other words, what is the upper limit? Yeah, that's a great point. That's what initially motivated us to kind of do these follow-up studies. A lot of work had been done for the ocean, but not for ponds. And we were like, well, what's the upper limit? Uh, and they do, they do end up being some of these strong upper limits, in particular for nitrate and nitrite. UV photolysis uh, limits them to those concentrations I showed you earlier. So even in the absence of even so, even in the absence of like seepage and so forth, that's going to impose a fairly hard upper limit that it's hard, relatively hard to get by. Similarly for sulfite, so far what we've modeled is sulfite loss due to exolution to the atmosphere. But in addition to that, in the next family of work, we're also gonna look at other mechanisms that haven't been considered for anoxic sulfite loss, including UV photolysis, but also seepage. Okay, great, thank you, Secret. Um, so Jordan Robert um, has their hand up. I'm gonna ask them to mute and they should be able to unmute themselves. Hi, thank you. Those talks were wonderful. I had a question for Mung. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. great. Um, I was wondering what you meant when you said that, um, I guess, the conversion of a CO2 rich atmosphere to a habitable one. Can you further explain what that meant? Uh, 
Uh, yes. So the thing is, it's linked to the early, very rapid plate tectonics. So our thinking was that, like the with the operation of plate tectonics, you can resurface the Earth quite frequently in the early Earth. So there are more exposed uh, places for you to weathering, and that would help to sequence CO two by forming carbonates. And also with the operation of early rapid plate, te plate tectonics, you subduct them back into the mantle. So it gives you a mechanism how to, first of all, remove the carbon into the crust and then subduct it into the mantle. Okay, okay, thank you. Thanks. Um, we have, I think, a couple questions from Tim Leons, or maybe it's just one. Um, so it says, for, for Meng, um, you mentioned possible consequences on the early carbon cycle linked to a very early onset of subduction. If true, what were the primary mechanisms and efficiencies of early CO2 removal from surface environments via subduction on the very early Earth, Hadean, um, given the absence of organic production or burial? Was it via subducting carbonates? Would marine carbonate rocks have been important given the likelihood of low early pH in the oceans? Hmm. So I think the first part of the question was similar to, to Jordan's. So it was like through subducting of forming and subducting carbonates. But for, for the second half of the question, was the marine carbonate rock have important given and the likelihood of low early pH in the oceans? Uh, that's a very good question. So I was thinking in the early Earth, the temperature was high. And so it may drive like the the weathering of the ocean any crust, to what extent, like how important it is, I think it's very difficult to determine because like, um, first of all, I don't think it's a very, very well known, the pH in the very early oceans. Um, yeah, I think, to, I think it will help to sequester carbonates uh, from the uh, to sequester atmospheric carbon, but how important it is, I think it should remain as like an open question. Okay. Thank you, Meng. Um, so uh, there's a question from Helen, um, again for you. <laughs> uh, you mentioned felsic rock as a source of um, potassium. Do you have conjectures regarding how potassium got into early cells? Uh, uh, do you have conjecture regarding how? Oh, so <laughs> it, it, so if I understand the question right, how the potassium that helps with the early cells, like the forming of the life, I think that is a little bit beyond the scope of my study. Uh, we mentioned the early source of potassium in the fossil rock as, as a way to explain why it, it will require the operation of plate tectonics, but we don't further discuss it, why the potassium, how the potassium got into early cells. Because so we are only using it as an indication because there were lots of potassium in the continental crust. You must have plate tectonics to generate the felsic rock. Yeah, and what it links to the early life is because the relation of plate tectonics to the other aspects of life, like sequester carbon dioxide, uh, lowering the temperature of the earth and bring up nutrient into the uh, surface of the earth. Um, I'm going to bring up this question first because it's kind of directed to two people instead of just Meng. Um, this is Meng and June. Uh, you didn't talk about hotspots, um, ocean islands as possible sources of land in the Hadean for an origin of life. There might be concern about lifetime of such ocean islands. What are your thoughts? Okay, may, uh, may, maybe I can handle this one. So. Of course, uh, we I think uh, we always have hotspots islands from the beginning of Hadean through Archean, and Man didn't uh, talk about it because uh, um, she in, in her talk uh, she wanted to focus on the 
especially expensive exposed land. And, um, and in my view, you know, like, like, like you know, um, a hotspot island like Hawaii could provide like a reasonable amount of exposed land. But uh, if I speak to some people who are working on this wet dry cycle, uh, if I say, you know, you, you just have oceanic island then some people become a little um, uh, nervous, you know, because they, they think that, that that's not massive enough. So of course, you know, uh, for, 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 for hotspot island that uh, we, we always have them. And also uh, we actually had the paper published earlier this year in Nature Geoscience, uh, the uh, lifetime of those hotspot islands could be very long. Like uh, uh, right now, uh, hotspot island become seamounts uh, in less than 10 million years, but it could be uh, you know, on the order of 100 million years uh, if you imagine the, how hotspot islands behave in the area Okay. Okay. Um... So I think this question might be directed to Sucrit. Um, it just says, do NOx and sulfite react with each other? Yeah, that's a, great, that's a great point. And the short answer is they definitely do. Um, for example, in that uh, paper from Tom, uh, from the Corel group, that's one of the things they invoked. They invoked that, that, nit that NOx and that sulfite reacting together and making an intermediate compound, which could potentially be stored. So um, once we've worked out the dynamics of these molecules in isolation, the next step is to work out their coupling and their coupling to all the other um, kind of components of those of the natural waters that would have been present as well. So the, to the carbon species, to the saline species, to the iron species and so on and so forth. And that's not something that's been done yet. So I would say that this particular area doing accurate aqueous phase kinetic modeling relative to the prebiotic era is still very much in its infancy and there's a great deal of fundamentals to be done. Thank you. Um, so this question is directed to Meng and June. Um, it says, on hot spots, you mentioned slow plate tectonics on early Earth. Does this make the lifetime of hotspot islands longer and the islands larger in size? Oh. Uh, actually, it, uh, oh, sorry, uh, this is actually a kind of similar question and also I probably partly answered this question uh, before, but uh, uh, it doesn't, okay, a lifetime hotspot islands could become longer in the Archean, but it doesn't get any larger in size because, um, you know, you if you imagine uh, like, a, you know, plates moving above um, on the plumes, uh, you create uh, oceanic islands. And then, uh, so the time for the islands you know, uh, being formed by uh, amount of plumes uh, is, is still limited. So uh, you have the similar size of hotspot islands even in the early Earth, but it could stay sub-aerial uh, for a substantial amount of time, like on the order of like, like 100 million years. Um, I think we, sorry. Oh no, yeah. go ahead. No, I think we when we mentioned the tempo of plate tectonics is because if um because we are considering the uh the shallowing of like a seafloor. So because that depends also on the amount of radiogenic heat in the seafloor, also the climb of the seafloor um stays on the surface. So if it's getting older, it's getting cooler, the seafloor shallows more and the hotspot islands may be. May, may stop being like sub but instead being submerged into the water. So that's how it link to the temporal plate tectonics. Yeah. Okay. Okay, and then we have um, a question from Ulrich. Um, so it says, to Meng, um, your model supports the early formation of continental crust but it is unclear how fast the ocean water was going down due to crustal recycling, thereby generating exposed land. Could you give an idea of how fast the reduction of ocean depth can be and give some idea about the uncertainties in this estimate? So we said in the very beginning of the earth, when the mantle was solidified, there was shallow ocean. And then maybe at the like early Hadean, because 
the uh, because fast plate tectonics will degas the water, so you have a deep ocean. And to the extent how much water was subducted back into the mantle again, we can see it from the sedimentary records because the relatively constant continental crust freeboard was documented in the sedimentary record, and the record can goes back to a key in like 2.5 billion years ago. So in this amount of time, like from present day to 4.5 billion years ago, we definitely know the continental crust remains relatively constant freeboard. So I think the largest time scale that of the ocean from uh, transfer from a deep ocean into present day ocean would be from the early Hadean to the end of Archean. But um, whether it could subduct it like a uh, faster, it depends on like exactly how much water was stored in Earth. And that, that's, I don't think is a very good constraint because people are still debating about how much water is in today's mantle. It's ranging from like uh, one ocean to, uh, to around like 10 oceans. So exact, uh, so if we don't exactly know how much water in the Earth to begin with, it's very hard to estimate the exact time that you're gonna subduct all the water into the mantle and become today's level. Uh, with the record we have now, it's definitely safe to say around 2.5 billion years ago, the continental crust was have the um, same level as present day. Okay, thank you, Mang. Um, so we had a question in the YouTube chat um, that says, I have a question. Do you think it is uh, more likely that a high concentration of basic life components on the early earth occur by geological process more than enrichment from interstellar medium? I think my short answer to that question is yes, just because most of the um, most organics, I think, would be, I would expect to be burnt up in their trend passage through the atmosphere. I think the, uh, that kind of the uh, space-based environment can be a really important way to access reducing power in the surface due to things like, uh, basically because reduced compounds are available out in the rest of the universe. So it's a great way of getting access to sulfide, great way of dumping reducing power into the system, but I wouldn't expect to find a large degree of complex molecules necessarily being delivered en masse, although right in impact craters, obviously you could have a little bit more of things like sugars and so forth, as we've seen from Murkison. Thank you. Um, there's a question in the chat uh, specifically for you, Sukrit. Um, it says you used two different concentrations of iron when investigating nitrate. Is there any specific purpose for that and why you chose those concentrations? That's a great question. I chose those concentrations to kind of bracket the range of iron concentrations that were proposed in the literature, with a lower estimate com coming from some of the work of Ite Halevi and the higher estimate coming from some work um, from the group at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Great. Uh, we have a um, comment from Barry Goldman. It says, thank you for these fan fascinating talks. Meng and June, we are talking about how early formation of continental crust helps lead to life, but what about whether even earlier life helped lead to continental crust? Could life have been necessary to form continents? Any thoughts? To form continental crust? I think I guess I need a little bit more um, context in this. Because <laughs> Yeah, um, I'm, I'm thinking because the continental crust formation is linked to like uh, the operation of plate tectonics and plate tectonics to make that possible, you need to have like a surface water on earth. Um, so if, if I think in a, a way like all the geologists think, unless you say like the early life can help with this issue, otherwise, um, from my knowledge now, I don't understand how the origin of life could help form continental crust. Yeah. I, okay, uh, I just browsed the abstract of the uh, cited paper and the authors suggest that uh, like uh, microbes could help the efficient hydration of oceanic crust uh, by enhancing uh, the like, fluid rock reaction and so on. So, um, but I think, uh, 
this hydration of oceanic crust, you know, how deep water can penetrate into the oceanic lithosphere is mostly controlled by uh, physical conditions. So I think the contribute, I mean, for, you know, maybe, you know, having microbes could locally enhance uh, hydration, but if we kind of step back and look at the, uh, you know, big picture of, you know, how uh, those processes proceed, uh, I, my guess is uh, it's gonna be probably minor component. Um, I should mention that a lot of these questions are directed to Meng, but Sucre, if you ever want to jump in, you're welcome to as well. Um, the next one's for Meng. Uh, it says, you mentioned that some geological evidence makes us confident that by 2.5 billion um, continental or billion years ago, uh, continental crust was likely to have the same area as today. Is there something special about that time period that continental crust would have accumulated to present day area at that time? Well, so, so first of all, I was say, saying like the sedimentary records tell us at 2.5 billion years ago, the continental crust have like a relative height to sea level that's similar to present day, which is called like the freeboard, continental freeboard. Um, so it doesn't necessarily mean that this geological record tells us the continental crust likely to have the same area as today. Is there any special about time period the continental crust would have accumulated to present day area at this time? Um, well, I think this, the special thing about 2.5 billion years ago is we started to have more geological record that is as old as 2.5 billion years ago. And before like that, like to the early Achaean, to the late Hadean, we just don't have much enough like a sedimentary record except for like Hadean zircon to tell us that but you don't have the rock record doesn't mean you don't have same amount of continental crust in the past because the continental crust was generated by plate tectonics and the very nature about plate tectonics is it's destroying its evidence along its operation so I don't think there is specific very like some very special thing about this 2.5 billion years ago. It's just at this time, we started to have more sedimentary records. Okay. Um, I have another question for you. Um, it says, how early formation of continental crust mediate the release, how, I guess, how could it um, mediate the release of molecular nitrogen into the early earth atmosphere? So I don't really study nitrogen by that, but I think, so since it connect to the release of nitrogen into the early atmosphere, the, 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 the generate and the destroy of continental crust all releases um, this volatile into the atmosphere. So the generation of continental crust release those volatiles and possible like nitrogen from the mantle, destroy of the continental crust, recycling and reworking, release the, could release nitrogen from the continental crust. So um, the early, so, so if you have early continental crust and have rapid generation and recycling, they can both potentially contribute to the release of nitrogen into the atmosphere. Okay. Thank you. Um, so we currently don't have any other questions in the chat. Um, I'll see if anyone else posts anything. And of course the speakers are welcome to have questions for each other as well, um, if you do. And um, yeah, we have about 10 more minutes. So um, if I don't, see any more questions in the next minute, then, um, then we've had a long discussion already. So, um, oh, thank you, Helen. <laughs> um, oh, I just got a direct message from her. So I think we are probably, I think we're probably finished unless anybody here has, um, unless one of the speakers have a question for each other. No? Okay, so thank you so much for um, 
three wonderful talks. I think that you all did an excellent job and I really enjoyed it. And um, just wanted to remind everyone that we do have um, a Slack channel where we can continue this discussion um, outside of the Zoom chat. Um, James Aguchi just posted it in the chat so that you can um, log in if you haven't already joined that group. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to say thank you again to the other co-organizers of the seminar series, as well as the PCE3 co-leads. Um, and thank you to our three great speakers today. And um, yeah, we'll plan to see you again in three weeks. Thank you so much. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you for the organizers. Yeah, thank you.